الله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. We continue إن شاء الله تعالى with the fiqh and the last part in the chapter of al-waqf, the endowment. Uh, and then إن شاء الله تعالى we'll take a hadith afterwards إن شاء الله تعالى. So uh, the last part of al-waqf, the endowment and talked about the definition of it and we need to mention that definition again with the subject of tonight because it's about the differences between al-waqf and wasiyah the waqf and al-wasiyah and al-wasiyah is the will and the next chapter is al-wasiyah so we'll talk about it inshallah ta'ala in details uh, so even though it might be a person would say let's study first the wasiyah and then we talk about the differences between both but he put it in that order so it's fine inshallah ta'ala it'll be easy and helps us, inshallah ta'ala, also to study al-wasiyah. And these two chapters and the rest of the chapters, of course, are very important. And uh, definitely we are in need to know the rulings of it. And if a person doesn't know, he should ask the people of knowledge. So um, let's go into the subject right away, inshallah ta'ala. And it will make us uh, kind of uh, review some of the things that we talked about al waqf so the last point here is he says al farq bayna al waqf wal wasiyah the differences between the waqf and the wasiyah and we'll see uh, some of the terminologies mentioned in the transition inshallah so al wasiyah is the bequest is the will so uh, first of all the number one before we, we go before we talk about the differences what is al wasiyah al wasiyah is a will so uh, anybody that, if he hears the word al wasiyah it refers to something that will be done after one's death. So uh, the wasiyah is basically ownership of something, as he will mention, but it's only to be owned after a person's death, not during his lifetime. That's why when people say or they start doing things, which we'll talk about it inshallah ta'ala, they have to be extremely careful. So let's start inshallah ta'ala and if there's questions at the end. The first one, he says, What's the definition of al-waqf? We said two words, tahbis and tasbil. And we should inshallah ta'ala get to know them in Arabic like this. There is asl and there is manfa'a. Al-asl is the item, is the object, and you do what to it? Make the habis of it. That you don't sell it. It should be there forever to as long as it stays. A person would give it as waqf, as an endowment. That means it's not to be sold, it's to be kept. And then the manfa'a, the benefit that comes from it is to make the tasbil of it becomes fi sabilillah. A person would specify where he wants to have the benefit from it to be given to what individuals or institutions or masajid or whatever there is. So this is the waqf. The wasiyya, tamlikun mudaf. He says tamlik, that means you have ownership. Mudafun ila ma ba'da al-mawt. It's to be added to the person after death. So it's not in one's lifetime. It's to be given to whoever he specifies after his death. So we have an individual. You know, his name is Ahmed, for example. He wants to do a good deed of charity. He has some money. So either he makes waqf or he makes a wasiyah. The waqf in his lifetime. He would say this apartment building is waqf. That means uh, it's never to be sold. And the benefits from it, rent or whatever, is to be given to even his own children or someone else or whatever he wants to specify. That's fine. And this is one of the differences that will come in shallow time. But if he writes a wasiyah, which is different than a waqf, that means... And that's why we have to make tahrir, as they say, the terminologies and the deen and the fiqh is so important. You have, because people can use things uh, loose. They say that I made this in the wasiyah, and he's not making wasiyah. He, say, he calls it wasiyah, but wasiyah has conditions and ahkam and rulings. You say, I, make, I made an endowment, I made a waqf. Is it really waqf or it's something else? You give someone a gift and you call it. So we have to make sure that every word is used is used in the right way. It's like someone saying, I made, I made salah, but he meant I made dua or something else. So the words have to be precisely described. 
الوصية is per, the same person this, uh, this person that his name is Ahmed is giving وصية that means he is going to give something like the waqf but to be owned after his death to be owned to someone else after his death تمليك مضاف إلى ما بعد الموت بطريقة التبرع by uh, basically giving something as a charitable thing you're giving something away سواء كان في الأعيان أو في المنافع whether it's something uh, specific physical item or in benefits uh, you know the benefits of a, of a, of a route uh, the benefit of uh, whatever you know money that he left so it's, it's going to be given after his death and he can specify whatever the wasiya but with the other conditions that are mentioned So this is the first differences between both the waqf and the wasi. Is it clear? This first one. The second one is clear the issue of tahbis al-asl versus the wasiya. You're giving something, the whole thing to be owned by someone else. Al-waqf is not going to be owned by anyone. Al-waqf is not owned by anyone. The asl, the item, it's, you know, like this. Forever to be there for the people to benefit from it. But al wasiya if you say, for example, a building, a person wants to give a building for waqf versus the wasi. If it's waqf, the building is never to be sold. It's not owned by anyone once a person gives it. And the benefit from it is to be given to whatever he writes down or he says that is for this to be given to other people or institutions and so on. Wasiya with that building, that means he would write in his will that this building is to be given to these individuals. After his death, or the benefit from it goes to these individuals, right? right, right. But this is would would require some details because it's after his death, after, and that's why waqf can be done after one's death. People can do it on one's behalf, but this will be waqf also. So uh, the the waqf is after one's death and not during lifetime. Number two, أن الوقف يلزم ولا يجوز الرجوع فيه. Al-waqf is lazim, is binding. And it's not permissible to take it back. So a person made waqf, and then he changes his mind the next day, it's too late. It's gone forever from his ownership. This is the majority of the people of knowledge are upon this. Because of the Prophet ﷺ, said to Umar anhu, in the hadith that we mentioned earlier, in shi'ta habist al-asl, if you will, keep the asl, retain, withhold, the asl, the, the, the item that you want to give away, and you give charity afterwards from the benefit of it. Uh, or, or, I'm sorry, or you give it for charity. So it's up to you. So he made the haps or with, withholding the, the land. So once it's binding, once he makes the waqf, then it's not permissible to break this contract. The wasiyah, is different. A person make, might make a wasiya today that he wants to include in his wasiya this building, this land, or uh, a relative that is not going to inherit. As we, this is one of the differences that comes later, inshallah, or to give this to the masjid or whatever there is, but after his death, right? Or he makes it as a wasiya. Then, it's also binding. It's binding, but a person can cancel it or remove something from it, or cancel it altogether. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not haram. So if someone makes a will, a portion of his wealth is to be given to this after he dies, as a wasiya. He can change that or cancel that. It's up to him. So this is the second difference, or point of differences. The third one, الوقف يخرج العين الموقوفة عن التمليك لأحد وتخصيص المنفعة الموقوفة المنفعة الموقوفة عليه. Right, so uh, it's kind of related to the first one that al waqf takes this specific ayn or the specific item that has been given for the endowment or for the waqf, takes it away from a tamlik, from the ownership for anyone. No one owns it anymore. And only the manfa'a, only the benefit to be given to the one that he specified that it to be given to. The wasiyah, it includes al ayn, it includes the item itself that is the subject of the wasiyah or the benefit to the one that he wrote the wasiyah for. Right? So uh, this is the difference between that this is ayn versus 
you know, the to be given as an uh, ownership versus the uh, waqf is no ownership for anyone whatsoever. Right? So uh, this is the third one. And the difference between that one and the first one is the first one is just give you the definition of both the waqf and the wasi. Right? So the wasiya is tamlikun mudaf. Right? The specific nature of the wasiya that it's to be given after death versus the waqf that is right there uh, and it's uh, to only to be the, for the benefit. Uh, number four, تمليك منفعة الوقف يظهر حكمها أثناء حياة الوقف. Also more specific, even we said it, that the the منفعة, the benefit that a person gets an ownership of it uh, from the وقف, the the effect of it comes when the وقف, the one that gives the endowment, the وقف is alive, and after his death. وللتمليك في الوصية لا يظهر حكمه إلا بعد موت الموسى. As for the effect of the wasiyah, it only shows after the death of the one that is making the wasiyah. Okay, so it's only after one's death. And that's why, again, most of the people, they do wasiyah. But the Sahaba, radiallahu anhu, those who have means, they would make more of the waqf. And both have evidences and ahadith and good things. And the early generations of Islam, also this is the wasiyah, is one of the ways to have good deeds after one's death. Or the opposite, a person might enter the hellfire because of wasiyah if he makes injustice in it as it will come inshallah ta'ala or do it for something haram. Number five, الوقف لا حد لأكثري There's no limit to how much waqf that a person can give. You know, you can give all of your entire wealth. Of course, you should not leave your family poor, but when it comes to waqf, it's your, in your lifetime. You can do whatever you want to your wealth. So there's no limit to it. The wasiyah has a limit to it, which is one third. Only one third. He says, meaning that if someone, out of ignorance or knowingly, he wrote in his wasiyah more than one third of his ownership, so whatever he owns, and he died. And then his family opening his wasiyah, his will, and they find that what he wrote in his wasiyah is more than one third. It's only to be fulfilled for the one for the one third and not the extra. Because the Prophet والسلام, he made it very clear that a thuluth is one third is the max. With thuluth kathir or kabir, as the Prophet والسلام, he said, that one third is even a lot. But this is the maximum. And that's why the ulama they say, as Ibn Abbas and others, it's better to do it less than that, like one fifth. Person should only give wasiyah one fifth of his wealth. So that he leaves to his heirs, uh, you know, something. أغنية, as the Prophet he said, for you to leave your inheritors as rich is better than to leave them for poor, they're depending on others. So if you have means, leave for them and still don't deprive yourself from giving something in a wasiyah because the wealth or the mirath or the inheritance, you don't have a choice in it. It's all by the laws of inheritance. Then inshallah ta'ala will talk about the laws of inheritance. It's specific shares or specific uh, you know, individuals that would inherit and some are not to, go to inherit. And this is by the laws of inheritance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Specific individuals. So a person is given in the wasiyah a chance to give of matters of goodness and charity after his death to other than those who would inherit from him. An individual who used to be kind to him, uh, you know, take care of him when he was sick, for example, before he died, or an institution or a masjid, whatever. He wants to give this after his death. So a good deed that happens, get initiated after his death, becomes, you know, in the balance of his good deed. So the wasiyah, it's not to be more than one third. He mentioned here, إِلَّا بِإِجَازَةِ الْوَرَثِ If the heirs, they're opening the will of the dead person and they find that he, his wasiyah is in more than one third, what should be done? He says, if they approve it, if they approve the, 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 what's more than one-third, all of them, uh, according to what's mentioned, it's permissible in this case. But let's take it a step back. It's haram for a person to do that. And this is a sinful way uh, for a person to write more than one-third in his will. It's haram. Uh, maybe he's ignorant, he doesn't know. Or it's sinful for him. But then for those who the inheritors, when they're uh, checking the will, 
they have to, this matter has to be extremely a person has to be extremely careful because people might get embarrassed or say it's okay you know i want to emotions are high and they're you know uh, they don't want to change anything if they will so that's why what needs to be done is if it's more than one third no not to be honored whatsoever and then afterwards after each one gets their own share share right they can do whatever they want they can say well i'm going to give this portion for whatever for example his father had wrote out of ignorance to be given to that place you know people then can do it from their own will uh, that's fine uh, so that they even be good to their the one that deceased so that they don't cause him to be punished as a result of that so illa bi ijazat al waratha as he mentioned so uh, the maximum is one third uh, before we continue uh, in the west in general since there's no such a thing as law of inheritance to be applied by the uh, court of law so the person has to have a will that in his will it's called will where this is the confusion comes in place a person would have a will and in the will he would write down that he needs his wealth to be distributed according to the laws of inheritance and either he explains it all not what relates to him because nobody knows who's going to die before who but rather to write all the laws of inheritance like these templates that people have you know if, uh, if a person dies and he have Uh, these types of uh, individuals are alive then each one will gets this or the entire as if it's a chapter from the laws of inheritance and then they can refer to a masjid or to say you know the this institutions or this uh, people of knowledge are to distribute this to my heirs you know things like this because again nobody knows who's going to live and who's going to die before who so not to assume that a person would say well he's married and he has three children so he would write in his will again in this country or in the west in general the laws of inheritance that related to him but what if someone dies before him what if uh, you know that uh, two people for example may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect everyone well even to the to the being specific if people have an accident and two died at the same time if one died five minutes before the other then the one that died first Uh, the one that died last or fi- after five minutes he inherits from the one that died first so they're not to be considered both died instantly unless they died instantly and so the laws of inheritance has to be applied so a person died instantly and then another person died after a day so the one that died instantly uh, then his wealth is going to distribute it and one of which is the one that died after a day will take a portion of it if he is someone from the heirs and then when that person died then that portion and his the rest of his wealth will be distributed according to the laws of inheritance and it doesn't have to be that uh, they have to do it immediately you know they can distribute all of this after a week but they have to make this calculation right so uh, the the point here is to include all possibilities in the wasiya meaning the wasiya that it's supposed to be considered as wasiya here because there's no laws of inheritance to be applied Unless a person refers to it to, to make sure that it's legally correct, that the wealth, one third or one fifth or whatever is going to be going to be given to this and this and that, this is the wasiya part. Then the rest is going to be applied with the Sharia, with the Islamic rules of inheritance, and the institution or the place that is responsible for this is this institution or this place. So they will take over and they will distribute the money the way that uh, I want them to do. So something of that nature, and of course there's templates for people to follow, and many other things with regards to bank accounts and joint bank accounts, and all of these things has to be fi- be figured out so that people do not get confusion after one's death. The the number six is al waqf yajuzu liwarif wal wasiya tu la tajuzu liwarif illa bi ijazat al waqf. Al waqf you can make waqf to someone that uh, is going to be from your heirs if you die before them. So you can make a waqf for your children. Nothing wrong with that endowment for your children, or for your wife, or for your wife and your children, right? And of course, in this case, a person has to be uh, equal, given things equal to his children, so that he does not prefer one over the other. But the wasiya, if it's in the will, it is not permissible to write in the will, which is up to one third, to any of the heirs or the inheritors. He cannot write anything for them because they would inherit anyway. 
So it is, this is the meaning of la wasiyah to be as the hadith of the Prophet والسلام, No wasiyah is to be written to someone that is already going to inherit by default, by the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But to apply this again in, in the West, meaning the, the laws of inheritance. But you have to include everything in your will to make sure that the money is not lost. And if the, someone died without writing a will, and the, the law would give his wife, for example, all of his wealth, then she is responsible to make sure that it's not her wealth. And she should not continue her life. Well, the husband, when he was alive, the money was there. We spent it on the family. Now he died, and we continue to do the same thing. So it's not permissible. Because uh, he might have a father or a mother uh, alive or whatever. The laws of inheritance has to be applied. And they have to figure out what's his money versus what's her money and things of that nature. So uh, that's why... Things has to be uh, dealt with with uh, so much uh, importance to it, and people. It's not a sign that a person is dying or anything. It's just the, you know people have to make sure that their fi- every person has his own financial identity in the Deen of Islam. There's no such a thing as just things are mixed like that. It's fine when their people are alive, but when they die, even if they're everybody agrees and everybody's no having no problems, whatever there is. But the, when it comes to inheritance, people don't have a choice but to own it. You know, you don't, you can't say I don't want my share of inheritance. It's not up to you. This is by the hukm of Allah. This is by the rulings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to have it. You don't have a choice. Take it and then do whatever you want to do with it. Give it all to the children of that's fine. But you have to have ownership of it first. You cannot say I, I make me void in this. This is uh, something that has to be done as it's going to be mentioned in the mirath inshallah ta'ala. So these are the six points. That he mentions here with uh, with the waqf, uh, you can kind of uh, put them together uh, because they're uh, similar in one way or the other. So, is it clear? Should we repeat them again, or it's clear? Or the six points? With the questions, inshallah, ta'ala uh, at the end, we'll take since we started this, we'll take the first part with the wasiyah, the uh, definition of it, and where it comes from as far as the evidences are concerned, and then. We continue next time, inshallah ta'ala. Al-wasiyya, ta'rif al-wasiyya, as it's also mentioned here in the differences. He says, al-wasiyya to hiya al-amru bit tasarru fi ba'd al-mawt. It's the command, it's the thing to be dealt with after death. So when a person writes in wasiyya, give this amount of money to so and so. You're given commands here for the people and that's why it's an obligation upon them to fulfill the wasiyya of the people. So al-amru bit tasarruf ba'd al-mawt after death. Wa tadammanu isal al-amanat that includes uh, a trust that a person has. Someone left money, uh, you know, when he was traveling, he left his money with someone. So he has to have a will. What if something happened to him? People would not know what is this money is for. So to make sure that everything the people left with him, any amana or any trust, wa tabarru bil mal or giving charity, wa tazwij al banat the daughters are to marry. This way or that way, washing the deceased. So even the wasiya in things that are not necessarily to be inherited. You know, a person, the, part of the wasiya, and you see the wasiya is for them to fear Allah and to have the taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to be obedient to Allah and not to uh, do bid'ah and innovations in one's janazah. If he knows that uh, these things can happen, he, then he needs to be very specific. You know, uh, not to uh, commit these bid'ah and innovations in one's janazah, not to um, hit one's face and weeping and tearing the clothes and all of these types of things. There's something that should be included in the wasiya if it's known that people might do these types of things. All of that is wasiya. So physical matters and non-physical matters and matters of deen and uh, who uh, to wash the body, who's to make salah on him. And it doesn't have to be included. A person doesn't have to say, uh, if he dies... This person is to make uh, taqseed from He's the one that washes the body. This person specifically is to lead the salah. They don't have to. It's not a must. It's an obligation. Some, as we will see, some things in wasiya are obligation. Some things are recommended. Some things are makruh, even disliked. Some things are haram. Some things are permissible. The five ahkam governs the wasiya. So, uh, for example, if someone uh, you know, has debt, then he has to Write a wasi, especially if the debt is not documented. So you have to make sure that it's clear in the wasi, otherwise it's haram on him. So this is an obligation. 
or uh, if a person writes something haram in a wasi, he gives uh, the money to uh, haram institution, riba institution, for example, or whatever, or things that sells haram, something like this. So uh, it can be haram. It can be something recommended like, you know, uh, charity, things of that nature. It can be something disliked if it's not uh, clear or it's doubtful. And it can be something permissible. Who to wash his body, who to make salah on him. But this might be obligation if he knows that if he dies, uh, a person of uh, evil would lead the salah on him. Or, you know, anything that can happen in the janaz. So all of that is, is feasible. <laughs> and to distribute the one third and the like of this. So the wasiyah includes all kinds of things. There's no limited way of it. But it's after that something to be given as a as a command or as an advice or a will to be executed after that. Uh, where that comes from? In the Quran and in the Sunnah and the consensus among uh, the Ummah, the Ulama. كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمْ إِذَا حَضَرَ أَحَدَكُمُ الْمَوْتُ إِنْ تَرَكَ خَيْرًا It's uh, ordained upon you if someone death falls upon him that he would leave something good of the wasi to leave the wasi and the prophet والسلام, he said ma hukm ri'in muslim law shay'un yusi bihi yabitu laylatayn illa wasiyatu maktuba this is the obligation part there's no uh, right that is upon a muslim he has something that he has to fulfill the rights of others and uh, he that he has to make a wasiya that he should not spend two nights unless his wasiyah is written by him to make sure that the rights are not wasted. And that's why things has to be documented. You know, this person, he, uh, I owe him this much money. Right? Then it has to be written. Uh, things of that nature because so that again, if after a person's death someone comes forward and says, hey, the, the deceased, uh, he owes me that much money. What if someone lies? So they should ask, what's the proof? Where did you get that from? Unless he's a trustworthy person. Someone comes from nowhere. Or it happens sometimes in, you know, in some parts of the world where a woman comes forward and says, uh, he was married to me. He was hiding that he has another second wife. So this is my husband. So I, you know, uh, inheritance is to be given to me. Where's the proof? Where's the witness? Those who witness the, the marriage contract. Then the first wife would say, after she was weeping on him, the tears goes back and she says uh, bad things about her husband. But again, so this is uh, things to be uh, taken care of and to be observed, especially if a person has rights. So if someone, for example, you know, have something like this, the things has to be documented. Or someone has uh, sons or daughters that the wife and the family that he's with, that they don't know anything about them. He was married before and divorced and no one knows anything about the their first family and these are his children. Uh, he has to make sure that th even though they might come forward and prove that. But again, anything that is, if a person dies, rights will be wasted, then it's obligatory upon the person to have a wasiya, to have a will. And then you add to it, if you are in a society or a place where if you just write a piece of paper, it's not going to be honored, so you have to take the legal means to honor your wasi. So if in a specific state it has to be notary public, for example, then you have to do this. Because if a person doesn't know where he's going to die or whatever, so what if they don't honor what he uh, mentions? Even though the wasiya becomes wasiya if he just even verbally says it. And the people, those who heard it, they should honor this and they should fulfill it. Unless it requires some legalities and papers and things like this, then... The person has to take these means. So again, it's a serious matter and, and people should take it serious, inshallah. But uh, we'll stop here, inshallah, ta'ala, with uh, the waqf and the wasiyah and then we'll take the hadith and then if you have any questions, you can go ahead, inshallah. Hadith number, and this is in Sahih al-Bukhari, in the last chapter of Kitab al-Tawheed, the chapter of Tawheed in Sahih al-Bukhari, 172. I think this is where we, where we stopped and correct me if I'm wrong. Number 70, 172. It's a little bit, not too long, but uh, do the best you can, inshallah. If you can't uh, memorize it, that's fine. You ready, inshallah? 172? Everybody's there? The hadith. And Ibn Umar, radiallahu anhumah, 
عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال مفاتيح الغيب مفاتيح الغيب خمس مفاتيح الغيب خمس مفاتيح الغيب خمس مفاتيح الغيب خمس لا يعلمها إلا الله لا يعلمها إلا الله لا يعلم ما تغيض لا يعلم ما تغيض الأرحام إلا الله لا يعلم ما تغيض الأرحام إلا الله ولا يعلم ما في غد إلا الله ولا يعلم ما في غد إلا الله ولا يعلم متى يأتي المطر أحد إلا الله ولا يعلم متى يأتي المطر أحد إلا الله ولا يعلم متى يأتي المطر أحد إلا الله ولا تدري نفس بأي أرض تموت إلا الله ولا تدري نفس بأي أرض تموت إلا الله ولا تدري نفس بأي أرض تموت إلا الله ولا يعلم متى تقوم الساعة إلا الله ولا يعلم متى تقوم الساعة إلا الله So these are five things. So the hadith, again, if you, uh, you don't have to memorize it, inshallah ta'ala, but we should uh, learn it and we should uh, understand the meanings of it, inshallah ta'ala. So uh, the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, said, Mafatihu al-ghaybi khamsun. The keys, mafatih is the plural of miftah. So mafatih, the keys of the unseen are five things. The keys of the unseen are five things. Number one, لا يعلمها إلا الله No one knows it except Allah No one knows it except Allah سبحانه وتعالى So uh, these are مفاتيح الغيب Which is by the way it's mentioned in سورة لقمان It's mentioned in سورة لقمان uh, إن الله عنده علم الساعة The end of the surah So that means Allah سبحانه وتعالى is the only one knows it And no one knows it except after Allah سبحانه وتعالى make them know it So لا يعلمها إلا الله Because the angels, for example, they get to know it's all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, uh, number one, لا يعلم ما تغيض الأرحام إلا الله. And this is also mentioned in the Quran. Uh, لا يعلم ما تغيض الأرحام. What's the only one that knows what's in the wombs? What the wombs push out? Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that what's in the wombs. Right, so what's hidden in the wombs, and taqid uh, from something that is becoming less or something hidden, so only Allah Subhanahu wa Taala knows ma taqid al arham, what's in the arham, what's in the arham, and then that's why they say, for example, ghada al ma when the water is hidden under the ground. So what's hidden in the wombs of uh, the mothers, only Allah Subhanahu wa Taala knows what's in the wombs of the mothers. Not just the uh, the gender, right? Even before it becomes clear, because this issue of when they can see with the ultrasound what the gender, this is not hidden. This is already there, right? But before it was there, only Allah Subhanahu wa Taala knows, and not just the the gender part, but it's the provisions as the Malak would come down and and uh, and and write these things for the for the 
fetus what's in the womb of the mother so the rizq is he from the people of the jannah or the people of the hellfire his lifespan and everything so only allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows this matter of unseen wala ya'lamu ma fi ghadin illa allah and no one knows what's in tomorrow except allah no one knows what's in tomorrow except allah because uh, this is again from the ghaib from the qadr of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wala ya'lamu ma ta'ti al-matar ahad illa allah and no one knows when the rain will come except allah no one knows when the rain is going to come except allah they can predict they can see the clouds are coming this way it's raining this way and and the, and the wind is blowing this way but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can make the wind move a little bit and it doesn't rain in this place or that place and it's a very obvious thing and it happens all the time and it's not that they they know the unseen it's just they see it this way this is how things are happening but even what they know of what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them the ability and the means and for them to see that is from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so no one knows it except allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wala tadri nafsun bi ayyi ardin tamutu illa allah and no nafs no soul knows what uh, land that it would die in except allah no one knows and that's why they 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 say if someone allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed for him to die in a certain place he will make him have a need in that place to go to it and he would die there no one knows when uh, when and where uh, a person would die wala ya'lamu mata taqumu as-sa'a illa allah and no one knows when the hour is going to be established except allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inna allah 'indahu 'ilm as-sa'a wa yunazzil al-ghayth wa ya'lamu ma fi al-arham wa ma tadri nafsun mada taksibu ghadan wa ma tadri nafsun bi ayyi ardin tamut as these five things mentioned in surah luqman allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the knowledge of the hour and he knows what's in the wombs of the mothers and he knows the rain he's the one that brings down the rain and no soul knows when what it's going to earn tomorrow and no soul knows when it's going to die so uh, that's why also we have to be careful with uh, when people say this person is going to you know when people say he's going to die in two months or three months no one knows when he's going to die you know they can say whatever they want right yes there are sickness they can basically they're saying we cannot do anything about it but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best and people take the means yes so these are the mafatih al ghaib al khams the five uh, keys of the unseen no la ya'lamu mata ya'ti al matar ahad illa allah no one knows when the rain will come except allah not to not to one basically there is taqdim and the the fa'il of ya'lam the knowledge uh, no one see how they translate it you say no one knows no one is ahad knows ya'lam when the rain will come mata ya'ti al-matar illa allah except allah so if you literally translate it how would you say it no no one uh, no no ya'lam <laughs> no uh, no knowledge when the rain would come by anyone except allah which of course it doesn't work that way so and that's in the in the language here there is of course uh, significance to this uh, because it uh, it gives the exclusive meaning of things so wala ya'lamu mata ya'ti al-matar ahadun so no one illa allah except allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wala tadri nafsun here nafsun comes first no soul uh, knows tamut, which uh, land it will die illa Allah wala ya'lamu mata taqumu as-sa'a illa Allah here ahadun is not mentioned so we can if someone doesn't want to memorize the every word of the hadith at least knows what are the five uh, keys of al-ghayb uh, that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows بارك الله فيكم وصلى الله وسلم على محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم سبحانك اللهم ربنا بحمدك اشهد ان لا اله الا انت استغفرك واتوب اليك